All right, well, it is, uh, it is a real honor to, uh, to be back in uh, Israel again for Core C++. I really, really love this conference. I love being here in Israel. It's great to see all of you. So my name is uh, Bryce edelstein Malbach. I've spent about a decade programming, and I've spent most of that time working uh, in C++ uh, and on the C++ programming language and uh, in HPC. And my background and my specialty is uh, in concurrency and parallel programming. Uh, I'm the chair of the standard C++ library evolution group, which designs and standardizes the C++ standard library. I also chair the American Committee for Programming Language Standards, and I serve as the editor for the inclusive terminology guidelines and inclusive terminology standard that the US national body is in the process of developing. I work at NVIDIA, um, where I lead our strategy for HPC programming models, uh, C++ compilers, and C++ libraries. Uh, previously, I worked at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and I started out my career under the tutelage of Hartmut Kaiser at Louisiana State University, where we worked together on the HPX parallel programming framework. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the C++ committee's plans for bringing parallelism, asynchrony, and accelerated computing into standard C++. Yep, but first we're going to make sure my clicker works. There we go. So the barrier to entry for parallel programming is far too high today. We live in a world where almost all hardware platforms are parallel and require explicit programming to utilize that parallelism. And despite that, many users and many code bases do not use parallelism. And for those that do, many have chosen approaches that are not portable across platforms, in particular that are not portable to accelerators such as GPUs. And so the C++ committee wants to build an on-ramp to parallel programming. We want to give users an easy to adopt solution that is going to be universally portable across platforms. We're not necessarily aiming to expose all the capabilities of each platform or the speed of light on every platform. We're looking to give you something that can help you get started with parallel programming. It's something that will be good enough for maybe 80 or 90% of your program that will get you onto that highway. And then maybe for some parts of your code, you'll have to switch into a fast lane. But hopefully that'll just be some key, some, a few key places. The clicker again is not working. There we go. So there's three pillars to our strategy for parallelism in standard C++. First, we need a corpus of common algorithms that dispatch to vendor-optimized parallel libraries. Next, we need tools to allow us to write our own generic parallel algorithms that can run anywhere. And then finally, we need mechanisms for composing parallel invocations into task graphs. So we're gonna start with the first pillar, the collection of common parallel algorithms. So C++ has had a set of serial algorithms for manipulating sequences of objects since the first standard. Uh, these algorithms operate on one-dimensional sequences. Initially, they were parameterized with iterators, but with C++20, we've introduced a new, more powerful abstraction, ranges. There's about 100 different standard C++ algorithms. We have for loop abstractions, filters, sorts, searches, rotations, reductions, scans, etc. Now in C++ 17, we introduced uh, parallel versions of these algorithms. The parallel overloads have the same interface as their serial counterparts except that they take an extra parameter, which is this execution policy, and that describes what form of parallelism is allowed, if any. So the execution policy describes the how of execution, but they don't specify where. That is left up to the implementation. Execution policy parallelism could be implemented with a variety of different strategies, such as a bespoke CPU thread pool, OpenMP, or GPU acceleration. So execution policies permit parallelism, but they do not require it. An implementation may choose to not parallelize. 
The execution policy overloads are all fork join synchronous. So the implementation will wait for the parallel operations to complete before returning from a call to one of these algorithms. So there's four different execution policies uh, in the standard. Seek indicates that all operations must be performed within the calling thread and must be indeterminately sequenced. So basically it says that no parallelism is allowed. <coughs> Unseek also requires all operations to be performed in the calling thread, but allows those operations to be unsequenced with respect to each other, which means that vectorization is allowed, but again, not required. That's sort of up to the implementation. Now, PAR allows the implementation to paralyze operations at its discretion. It does not require parallelism. It simply allows it. However, it also requires that all operations within each thread be indeterminately sequenced, meaning that vectorization is not permitted. Now, par unseek allows operations to occur in multiple threads and to be unsequenced with respect to each other, meaning that both thread and vector parallelism is permitted. And again, this means that parallelism is allowed, but not required. An implementation may choose to not parallelize or not vectorize. For example, if you call you know, sort on two elements. It's probably not going to go and try to do that on a GPU because it'll just be faster to do that on the calling thread. So let me show you an example of one of my favorite uh, uh, parallel algorithms, which is a word count. So we're gonna write this with a single parallel transform reduce. So transform reduce is a new algorithm that we added in C++ 17, which is a combination of transform and an, uh, a summation or a reduction. So it takes both a transformation operation and a reduction operation, and it applies the transformation to the inputs, and then uses the reduction to sum the results of those transformations. So if you're familiar with MapReduce, this is C++'s form of it. So we're gonna use the overload of transform reduce that takes two input sequences and a binary transform function. The first input sequence will be the entire string except for the last element. And the second input sequence will be the entire string except for the first element. So this means that our binary transform function is gonna be passed a window of every two adjacent characters in the string. So our transformation function's job is gonna be to tell us whether those two adjacent characters that it's looking at are the beginning of a word. If the left character is white space and the right character is a not white space, then the right character is a, the beginning of a word. So the pseudo sequence that's gonna be performed, that's gonna be produced by that transformation will look like this. For every word, one and only one of the transformation invocations returns true. But what about uh, that first character of the string? That might be a start of the word, and we never actually test it with our transformation function because it sort of starts testing at the second character when it's looking at this window. So we need to account for this in the uh, uh, initial value of the reduction, which is what we do right here. And so our reduction operator is just plus. After the transformation, we've got a sequence of bools which has one true value for every word. And so summing that sequence into an integer will give us the word count. So this is standard C++ code. It's parallel, it's portable. You can run it anywhere. You can run it in parallel on your GPU, on your server CPU, on your laptop, even on your phone. So in C++ 20, the standard library introduced ranges. Now, unlike iterators, ranges are designed from the ground up to be composable. Ranges allow us to express a wide range of algorithms in terms of a few key primitives and compositions of those primitives. Used in conjunction, the ranges and that we added in C++ 20 and 23 um, and the C++ 17 parallel algorithms are quite powerful. So standard C++ algorithms iterate over sequences of objects. Um, for example, the elements of a container. But sometimes we want to iterate through indices instead of objects. So this is particularly important in numeric and scientific computing. 
So we can do this using IOTA, a range factory that was introduced in C++20. So IOTA produces a range of monotonically increasing integers. For example, IOTA 1 comma n will produce a range of all integers from 1 to n minus 1. So instead of passing iterators to a container to a parallel for each, we can instead pass an IOTA range, giving us a parallel for loop over the indices instead of objects. We can also use parallel algorithms and ranges to iterate multidimensional index spaces. C23's Cartesian product range adapter takes multiple input ranges and produces a range of all the ordered tuples formed by taking an element from each of those input ranges. So we can use this in conjunction with IOTA to create ranges that represent multidimensional index spaces. So for example, here we use this pattern to write a simple parallel matrix transpose. So the range V here will produce two element tuples from 0, 0 to n minus 1, m minus 1. And the iteration order here will be row major. The second index will be contiguous. And we can change to column major by switching the order of arguments to Cartesian product. So the C17 uh, execution policy parallel algorithms are fork join synchronous. And so each invocation launches its work in isolation and blocks until that work completes. So for example, if we invoke two parallel for each's on the same data back to back, we'll get two parallel work launches. So the caller will be blocked waiting for the first invocation to finish, and only then will the second invocation be enqueued and launched. But this like transfer of control back to the caller is going to introduce a latency bu bubble, and that can degrade performance, especially if you're using some sort of accelerator, which might have a longer latency to enqueue the work. You want to enqueue that work as early as you possibly can, and that means doing it asynchronously. So one way we can address this problem is to fuse the operations together into a single parallel operation, which can be done with the transform range adapter. So transform takes an input range and a function and returns a range uh, that is the result of applying that function to the input. Now this is done completely lazily. The function is only evaluated as needed when the elements of the returned range are accessed. So for example here, f is not evaluated until the elements of v are accessed in the parallel for each. Now this is a big change in semantics because previously we had a guarantee that all invocations of f would happen before any invocations of g. And we'll no longer have such a barrier if we rewrite the code this way. But in some cases that might be perfectly fine. So another useful range adapter is filter, which takes an input range and a predicate function and produces a range of all elements of the input for which the predicate returned true. So again, this is done lazily. The predicate isn't evaluated until the elements of the returned range are accessed. And there's no temporary storage here. It's just done on the fly. So here we're using filter in combination with a parallel reduction to sum only the positive elements of a container. So now let me show you some uh, applications that have uh, adopted standard C++ parallelism. So Lulash is a uh, mini-app for Lagrangian explicit hydrodynamics on a, an unstructured uh, grid. It's designed as a benchmark to stress test um, vectorization, parallel overheads, and on-node parallelism. And it's been ported to several frameworks and programming models uh, such as MPI, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, Raja, Cocos, Sickle, and now standard C++. So with the standard C++ version of Lulash, you can get performance that matches many of the other backends, um, but writing just portable standard C++ code that you can build with any compiler, GCC, NV, C++, Intel, the Microsoft compiler, and that you can run on any platform. So another example is STLBM, which is a lattice Boltzmann framework written from the ground up in standard C++. And it can run on multi-core CPUs and GPUs without any code changes. It doesn't use any language-specific extensions, uh, external libraries, vendor-specific code annotations for pre-compilation steps. It's just portable standard C++. 
So another example is Maya, which is a code base for uh, aerospace flow and noise simulations. And it's been ported to C++ standard parallelism. And again, here, we can take the same code, the same standard C++ code, and run it in parallel on both CPUs and GPUs. So these C++ parallel algorithms that we added in C++ 17 are great, um, but they're really just the start of the story. So they have two major limitations. First, they are all fork join synchronous, as I've mentioned. So they launch the parallel work, and then they wait until that work has completed before they return to the caller. So now, where exactly do they launch that work? Well, that's the second problem. By design, users have no control or visibility into where the parallel work runs. So it happens on some amorphous implementation-defined execution context. That could be a CPU thread pool, it could be a GPU stream, it could be Grand Central Dispatch, it could be Windows fibers, et cetera. Implementations have complete freedom and users essentially have no control or visibility into what's happening. One of the reasons for this, and one of the reasons we picked this design is because today C++ has no standard model for asynchrony and no standard way to express where things should execute. But fortunately, the solution to that is coming soon to your C++ implementation, and it's called senders and receivers, and this is a asynchronous execution framework for standard C++. So let's look at a simple example here. So first, we need to get a scheduler from somewhere, um, from some execution context, and the scheduler could come from a thread pool, a tasking system, a GPU driver, et cetera. And then to start a chain of work on that scheduler, we call schedule, which returns a sender. That sender will complete on the execution context that's associated with that scheduler. Next, we're gonna use a sender algorithm, then, to compose work onto the sender that we got from that scheduler. And this work will be performed on the same execution context. That sender algorithm will return a new sender which we can then use to add more work onto the chain using another call to then or another sender algorithm. And then finally, we wait until the chain of work has completed using sync wait, which will return the value sent by the final sender in the chain. So there's three key concepts here. Schedulers, senders, and receivers. So schedulers are handles to execution contexts. Schedulers produce senders. Senders represent the asynchronous work that will essentially send a signal. They can be composed together into sender algorithms to form task graphs. And then receivers process asynchronous signals from senders. So let's start off by looking at schedulers in a little bit more detail. So I said that they're handles to execution contexts, but what exactly does that mean? So what's an execution context? Well, an execution context is a resource that represents the place where execution will happen. So this could be a concrete resource like a specific CPU thread pool, uh, a GPU stream. Um, it can also be something more abstract like the current thread of execution. Execution contexts don't necessarily have a representation in code. Today, they don't have any exposed interface actually. And they may have state associated with them like OS handles, memory, metadata, et cetera. Now schedulers just represent a strategy for submitting work to execution contexts. They're lightweight, not only handles to contexts. Schedulers are cheap to construct and pass around and they, in the execution context, will hold all the state. So schedulers are to execution contexts what allocators are to memory resources. They're just these lightweight handles that we can pass around. Multiple schedulers might refer to the same execution context, including multiple different kinds of schedulers. So for example, you might have two different schedulers that submit work to the same execution context, but with a different priority. You might even have a scheduler that dispatches work to multiple different execution contexts, for example, to do load balancing. So we use schedulers to produce senders that will perform work on the execution context associated with the scheduler. Once we've obtained a sender from a scheduler, we can compose work on it. So 
So now let's take a look at senders themselves and how we actually compose them together. So as I said before, senders represent asynchronous work. They form the nodes of an asynchronous task graph, which may span multiple schedulers in multiple execution contexts. Senders are lazy, so you have to explicitly start them. And when a sender's work completes, it sends a signal to the receivers that are attached to it. So receivers are handles that, handlers that get notified with a signal that's sent by a sender. There's three different handling paths, which we call channels. So the value channel is used to indicate successful completion and may pass one or more values to the receiver. The error channel indicates that the sender's work failed and passes some sort of error object that contains information about that failure. The done channel is used to indicate that the sender's work was canceled and before it could be performed. Now this is distinct from the error channel because cancellation is not an error. It's something that may happen during the course of normal operations. So each sender will notify its attached receiver with one signal, meaning that only one of these three channels is going to be invoked. So now let's take a look at how senders and receivers are actually get hooked up to each other. So we're going to start off with some scheduler, which we will get a sender from by calling schedule on it. Now, a receiver is attached to a sender via a connect call. This is a behind the scenes sort of operation that you won't usually see in your code. It usually happens um, sort of uh, in the back end layer where you're for, by people who are writing their own senders and receivers. Now, connect returns an operation state which contains the actual work that the sender represents. Eventually, you initiate the work by calling start on that operation state. And again, that sort of happens behind the scenes. After some time, the operation is going to complete, and then it's going to notify the receiver with the signal. So now let's take a look at sender composition itself. So we compose senders together using sender algorithms, and there's a few different forms of sender algorithms. The first is sender adapters. So sender adapters take one or more senders as parameters, and they return a sender. So most sender adapters are pipeable, just like range adapters. The semantics are similar to Unix shells. So send pipe uh, F pipe G is equivalent to G of F of send. Languages like Haskell and APL call this point free style. The primary input argument here is not explicitly named. And this syntax is essential for the elegant composition of senders and, and for the elegant uh, authoring of asynchronous code. So composing senders via nested function calls would be a bit of a mess because the order in which operations occur would be inverted from the order in which they would appear in code. So in this example here, the predecessor senders are more deeply nested and thus appear after their ancestors. So things get a bit clearer when we instead use temporary variables for each stage of the composition. But this can be quite error prone because it's easy to mix up one of those named variables. The pipe syntax gives us a clean way to compose chains of senders in the order that they will be evaluated that's not prone to errors. So now let's walk through some of the uh, most important sender adapters. So then, which we've already seen, takes an invocable f and calls it with the values sent by the prior sender. The sender returned from then will send the results of the invocation of f. So this is how you attach a continuation to a sender. Bulk is similar to then. It evaluates the invocable once for every index in the shape n. So in the simplest and most common case, the indices are one-dimensional and start at zero. And the shape argument is just an integer uh, indicating how many invocations you perform. So the sender uh, returned from bulk is just going to pass along the signal from the prior sender. Transfer changes the scheduler that will be used for the next sender. So it says, you know, switch over to this scheduler going forward. 
Now, some senders can only be connected to a single receiver, for example, because they move any values or errors that they send instead of copying them. And we call these one-shot senders. Senders that can be connected multiple times are called multi-shot senders. The split sender adapter takes any type of sender and returns a multi-shot sender that passes along the signal from the original sender. So split senders represent places where we fork in a sender task graph or where we introduce parallelism. Conversely, when all takes multiple input senders and returns a single aggregate sender that sends the signals from all of the inputs. So the senders returned by when all do not have a scheduler associated with them, which means they do not promise where they complete because it would be a little bit tricky for us to just arbitrarily pick which one of the multiple input senders we should complete on. So instead, we ask you to be explicit about that. So these win all senders represent joins in a sender task graph. Now ensure started connects and starts a sender, returning a new sender that will pass the signal sent by the original. If the input sender is a composition containing other senders, those senders will be connected and started as well. So as I said before, senders are lazy and this is a way to kick them off eagerly. Now, sender factories are another type of sender algorithm. They do not take senders as parameters, but they do return a sender. So sender factories are used to start new chains um, and graphs. The senders that they return are the root nodes. So we've already seen one sender factory schedule, which returns a sender that completes on the specified scheduler. So the return sender from schedule doesn't send values or represent any actual work. It's just a handle that you can use to compose work on the scheduler. Just is another uh, sender factory. It takes a set of values and produces a sender that will send those values immediately when connected. The last type of sender algorithms are sender consumers. So these take senders but do not return senders. They typically launch a sender graph by connecting and starting it. So they're the leaf nodes of sender graphs. So sync weight is a sender consumer and synchronization primitive that blocks until a sender completes and then returns or throws whatever was sent. So now let's discuss some of the details of how sender graphs get formed. So let's suppose that we just have a single link in a chain or graph of senders. So we're gonna have some abstract before sender adapter on the left-hand side of this link, and a concrete then adapter, and then an abstract after adapter on the right-hand side. If we unroll the pipe syntax, we're gonna have code that looks like this. We've got a before sender that came from somewhere. We then create a then sender, which will contain the before sender and the function f that it will apply to whatever that before sender sends. And then we'll also create an after sender, which will contain the then sender. So that's going to give us a nested structure of senders that will look like this. At some point, we're going to connect a receiver to the outermost and last sender, the after sender. Then each sender in the nested structure will connect a receiver to its child. And this is going to happen in the opposite order of sender construction. And then that's going to give us a nested receiver structure that's the inverse of the sender structure. And we'll also have a nested operation state structure that's produced and returned from connect. So eventually, we're going to start that operation state. And as operations complete, they'll begin notifying their receivers with signals. When the before receiver gets its signal, it will notify the then receiver. If it's a value signal, the then receiver will invoke f with the value and signal the after receiver with the result of that invocation. So now let's look at a slightly more advanced example. Um, we're going to build a generic, asynchronous, and parallel inclusive scan. We're going to write it as a pipeable sender adapter so that it can be composed with other sender algorithms. So this is going to take three parameters. First, a sender, 
which we'll expect to send the input as a range, an initial value, and the number of tiles to split the input into. So we're gonna use the classic two-pass parallel scan approach, which requires temporary storage for partial results communicated between tiles. Now we need to allocate that temporary storage asynchronously once the prior sender has sent us the input. So we'll chain the then sender onto the prior sender. In the body of that continuation, we'll create a std vector to hold the partial results. And then we'll return both the input range and the vector, which will send it to the next thing in the chain. Next, we need to do the first parallel pass, which is called the down sweep. So we'll use bulk to invoke the body of the pass for each of the tiles. The first thing we do for each tile is calculate the range of elements that belong to that tile. Then we're gonna take all of the elements in each tile and we're gonna perform a local serial inclusive scan on them, which is gonna give us this. And we do that right here in the code. So next, we need to propagate information between tiles. The sum of each tile needs to be added to the elements of all preceding tiles. So we've already computed that sum. It's just the last element of each one of the local inclusive scans. So we're gonna store that last element into the partials vector. Assignments to that partials vector from different tiles may happen concurrently, but that's perfectly fine. Each tile uses a different and unique slot in partials, and no one reads from partials yet, so there's no data race here, and there's no need for synchronization. Then, after all the tiles have completed their local inclusive scans and written to partials, we need to barrier and then have one execution agent do a serial inclusive scan of partials. So we're gonna do this by piping another then sender onto the chain, which will perform the partials inclusive scan. And we do that right there. And this then sender will again pass along the input sequence and the partials vector to the next uh, sender in the chain. So the result of the scan over partials is gonna look like this. The information that each tile needs to add to its elements is in the partial slot for the tile directly preceding it. Now we need to go parallel again to distribute that information within all the tiles. So this is the upsweep pass. So we're gonna pipe another bulk, once again, over all tiles. And in the body of this bulk, we'll need to calculate which elements belong to the current tile, just as we did before in the downsweep pass. <laughs> then we use a serial for each to increment each element in the tile by the appropriate value from the partials vector. And so after that addition, we'll have the correct result. So finally, we want the sender returned by our asynchronous inclusive scan to only send the input sequence, not the partials vector. So we add a final then sender, which only passes along the input. So the partials vector will be destroyed when this then sender completes, cleaning up the temporary storage that we asynchronously allocated. And that's it, we're done. We've written a generic asynchronous and parallel inclusive scan that we can run on any scheduler that we want just by passing in the right type of sender. So we can imagine that we'll have a whole set of asynchronous parallel algorithms based on senders and ranges. The design space for these interfaces is still a bit open. It's straightforward for some common cases, like a series of 4-H over the same sequence. Uh, we could just have an in-place transform async, which takes a sender of a range and a callable and returns a sender of a range. And then it would be easy to rewrite that series of synchronous 4-Hs into a lazy asynchronous operation with transform async. But let's look at a slightly more interesting case, normalizing the elements of a range. Now we can do this by getting the maximum element of the range and then dividing each element by that one. 
it's a bit more challenging to map this to asynchronous execution in the piping syntax because the piping syntax is great when you have one dependent value that you want to pass down the chain, such as a single input sequence. But in this case, there are two asynchronous inputs to the second call, the input sequence and the maximum element. So we might want asynchronous parallel algorithms to return richer senders. For example, maybe reductions like max element async should uh, send both the input sequence that was passed to it and the iterator to the maximum element. We might also want a uh, more advanced form of the piping syntax that lets us introduce placeholder values um, so that we can pass multiple th things down uh, the chain. So we've developed a prototype implementation of standard C++ senders and receivers that supports CPU schedulers, GPU schedulers, and distributed schedulers. And let me show you some examples of the applications that we've already ported to it. So this is a uh, simple electromagnetic uh, wave simulation um, uh, that uses Maxwell, that solves Maxwell equations on a uniform grid. And this is the entire solver loop, um, which is just expressed as a graph of senders. So this code can be run with a variety of different schedulers. By changing just one line of code, the kind of scheduler passed to the solver, we can go from running inline on a single CPU thread to running in parallel on a CPU using OpenMP, to running on a single GPU, to running on multiple GPUs within a single node, to multiple nodes scaling up to thousands of GPUs. So with standard C++ senders and receivers, you can change one line of code and scale from a single CPU thread up to an entire cluster of GPUs. So Palabos is a framework for parallel computational fluid dynamic simulations using the Lattice Boltzmann method. And we've ported one of its applications to standard C++ senders and receivers. So this simulation models carbon sequestration techniques. The porous structure that you see is sandstone and it's filled with saturated salt water, which is not visible on this representation. The red bubbles correspond to liquid CO2, which is injected at the bottom and travels through the sandstone because of buoyancy forces. Using our distributed GPU scheduler, we've been able to run this application at scale on up to 512 GPUs. So senders and receivers are the next major step in the development of C++ standard parallelism. They deliver the second and third pillar of our plan. This framework gives us the tools we need to write our own generic parallel algorithms that can run anywhere and the tools to compose asynchronous task graphs. Following the standardization of senders and receivers, will introduce new asynchronous sender-based versions of the standard parallel algorithms. But now I want to switch focuses a little bit and talk about um, multidimensional algorithms and multidimensional data representations in C++. So today, C++ really has no reasonable abstraction for multidimensional data. And this is unfortunate because many of the interesting compute-heavy problems that benefit from parallelism have a multidimensional shape. And that's why we're introducing MDSPAN, a multidimensional span type in C23. It's very similar to the one dimensional span that was introduced in C20. So MDSPAN is non owning, it's just a handle to some underlying data. It doesn't manage the lifetime of that data. And thus, MDSPAN is cheap to copy, it just contains a pointer and metadata describing the size and shape of the structure. Metadata, such as the extent of a dimension, can be expressed either at runtime or compile time, allowing for metaprogramming and compile time optimizations. MDSPAN parameterizes how a multidimensional index is mapped to a location in the underlying data. We call this parameter a layout, and it can express any kind of multidimensional structure. There are some concrete layouts in the standard library for common use cases, but anyone can define their own layout and plug it into an MDSPAN. Likewise, MDSPAN parameterizes how it accesses the underlying data. The default is just to perform a normal C++ pointer dereference with an index. But with a custom accessor, you could instead use a special cache bypassing instruction, read from disk, or perform a remote memory access. 
MDSPAN uses extents objects to express the number of dimensions in a space, the rank, and their length, the extents. So extents objects take a size type and a variadic number of integrals of that type as template parameters. For dynamically sized extents, the magic value dynamic extent is used as an integral template parameter and the extent is passed to the constructor. Now through the power of C++20's class template argument deduction, when you're working with all dynamic extents, you usually don't need to spell out the entire verbose instantiation because the compiler can figure out um, from the constructor arguments. So in this case here, the E0 code is equivalent to the more verbose E1 version that spells out uh, the full template parameters. There's also an alias D extents for the all dynamic extents case. It takes just a single parameter in integral specifying the rank. For statically sized extents, the extent itself is passed as an integral template argument and no corresponding ar constructor argument is needed. You can mix static and dynamic extents. For example, in this case, um, we have one static extent and one dynamic extent, so we'll need to pass just one extent at runtime. So extents objects in MD span support arbitrary rank. You can have as many dimensions as you want. However, it is all static rank, so you need to know at compile time how many dimensions you want. MDSPAN itself has four template parameters, two of which are optional. So the first is the element type. The second is the extents type, and this must be a specialization of the extents class template. The third is a layout, and the default is layout right. And we're gonna discuss layouts a bit more in a few moments. And the final parameter is an accessor, which performs element access. So MD spans of all dynamic extents have a pretty simple syntax, um, just like extents because of class template argument deduction. You can construct one without specifying any template parameters. Now, if you do need to spell out the type, it's still pretty concise. You can just use the D extents alias. The elements of an MD span are accessed via the index operator. Thanks to a recent core language change in C++23, indexing operators can now take multiple parameters, so this is now possible. You can also make MD spans of static or mixed extents. So the simplest way to construct these is by passing an extents object as the second constructor argument. So now let's talk a little bit more about layouts themselves. So the two most common layouts are layout right and layout left. So layout right you have the rightmost extent as contiguous, meaning that its stride is one, and that strides increase from right to left as the product of extents. So this is the layout for C++ built-in arrays and NumPy, and it's also the default for MD span. For example, if we had a two by two matrix, the two elements on the first row would have data locations zero and one, and the elements on the second row would have data locations two and three. With layout left, the leftmost extent is contiguous, so its stride is one, and strides increase left to right as the product of extents. So this is the layout that's used by Fortran arrays and by MATLAB. So if we had a two by two matrix in layout left, the two elements in the first column would have data location zero and one, and the two elements in the second column would have data location two and three. There's also a standard layout, uh, layout stride, that allows you to explicitly specify the strides for each extent. So all three of these concrete layouts in the standard library are just implementations of the layout concept. Generically, a layout is just something that maps a multidimensional index to a data location. Anyone can define a layout. Uh, layouts may be non-contiguous. They may map multiple indices to the same location, and they may perform complicated or expensive computations. They may even have or refer to state. Parameterizing layout is critical because it allows us to write generic multidimensional algorithms that can be used with any layout. 
This is an essential component of portability because different layouts may be needed on different platforms to deliver on performance. So today, we have a major vocabulary problem with multidimensional types in the C++ ecosystem. Suppose I write a function using a concrete owning multidimensional type like eigenmatrix. So my users will be able to pass an eigenmatrix to this function, but what if they have a boost uBoss matrix or a Petsy matrix or a blaze matrix or a cutlass tensor or a multidimensional array that's been passed to them from Fortran? And that's where MDSpan comes in. By using it in your, in your interfaces, your code can work with any multidimensional data structure. Because MDSpan is just a non-owning handle, you can construct one that refers to an Eigen matrix, to a Boost UBoss matrix, to a Petsy matrix, et cetera. So for example, let's suppose that we had our own row major matrix class like this. We can add a simple MDSpan conversion operator allowing us to pass our matrix class to any interfaces that expect an MDSpan. In some more complex cases, we might have to write our own layout type. Now let's look at how we can use MDSpan. So this is a simple 3D seven-point stencil inner kernel, similar to what you'd see in a HPC proxy application like MiniGhost. We have two 3D MD spans here representing the problem state. And using that Cartesian product of IOTA's uh, technique that I showed you earlier, we build a range that's iterating the index space and then use a parallel for each to iterate that space in parallel. If we want to change the layout, all we have to do is change the input MD spans. Everything else will stay the same. Earlier, I showed you this example of a simple parallel matrix transpose, and we used span and dealt with the multidimensional indexing manually. Now, that's not particularly portable. We've hard-coded a specific data layout, which may not make sense in all circumstances. It's also pretty error-prone because it's easy to make a mistake in the indexing formula in any of the multiple places where we might have to handwrite it. So we can improve this by using MD span instead. Now we can change the layout by simply changing the type of the MD span that we use. So I'm fairly happy with that last slide, but I want more down the road. I'd like to be able to write something like this. And there's three things here that we don't yet have. The first is parallel algorithm overloads that accept ranges directly instead of iterator pairs, but that's coming down the road. The second is an indices method on MD span that returns a range of its multidimensional index space. And then the third is a language extension to destructure uh, tuples and parameters so that we don't have to uh, have that line right here where we do the destructuring, this one. And going a step even further, of course, we want an asynchronous version of this that parameterizes where it runs so that we can run it on a CPU, on a GPU, et cetera. Now, MDSpan has a powerful slicing interface called sub-MDSpan. Um, it takes an MDSpan and returns a sliced MDSpan. So because MDSpan is not only cheap to copy, slicing is also cheap. You're just creating a new view of the same underlying data. The input MDSpan is not modified. For each extent of the MDSpan, you pass a slice specifier to sub-MDSpan. And there are three kinds of slice specifiers. First, you can specify a single index to be selected for an extent by passing an integral as a slice specifier. The rank of the returned MD span will be reduced by one for each single index slice specifier that you use because you've sort of sliced away that entire dimension. You can also pass a range of contiguous indices to be selected for an extent. Finally, you can pass full extent to select an entire extent. So for example, here we have a 3D MD span M0, and we make a slice of it by selecting eight indices for each extent, starting at indices 15, 31, and seven, respectively. So the MD span that's returned by sub MD span M1 will have a rank of three, because we didn't use any of those single index slice specifiers that would have caused a rank reduction. We're still working in a 3D space. And each of the extents of this sliced MD span will be eight. The multidimensional indices for M1 will be offset from what they would be for M0. 
So for example, M1000 would be equal to M01531.7. Let's take a look at another example, this time with rank reduction. So we're going to slice M0 again, selecting, selecting index 15 for the first extent, the entire second extent, and index 31 for the third extent. So the MD span that we produce, M2, will have rank 1 because we've essentially taken a line out of a three-dimensional space. And the extent of that rank will be 128, the extent of the second dimension of M0. So iterating this 1D slice would be equivalent to accessing M0 with a fixed index for the first and third extent. So sub MD span can be a pretty useful tool for writing tiled algorithms. So let's build a tiled version of the parallel matrix transpose that we looked at earlier. And we're going to work with square tiles with extent T by T. So first, we need to arrange describing all the tiles. And we're going to, again, use the Cartesian product of IOTA's trick for this. It's OK if the tiles at the edges extend uh, beyond the bounds of the matrices, because we're going to deal with that in a moment. Then we have our parallel for each. And this time, it's going to iterate over tiles, not all of the indices. For each tile, we're going to create a new sliced MD span, A and B, using sub MD span. First, we need to determine what range of indices we need to select based on the coordinates of the tile. And this is where we handle tiles that would go beyond the bounds of the matrices. We just truncate them to the ends of the matrices. Now we'll pass the tuples describing the indices that we want to sub MD span, producing the local MD spans for this tile. And then next, we'll, we need a range of the multidimensional indices within a tile. And again, we'll use Cartesian product of IOTA for that. And then finally, we use a C++ range space for loop to iterate over the indices of that tile and perform the transpose with the local MD span slices that we made. And with that, we're done. So there's, there's a few limitations to MD span. Most notably, MD span doesn't have iterators. And if you want to learn a little bit more about that and a little bit more about the future direction of iterating through multidimensional spaces, uh, you should go watch the video of my uh, CPP North uh, talk um, called Multidimensional C++, which goes into this in uh, far greater detail. So the set of standard C++ algorithms that we have today is great, but it's not complete. What we have is primarily focused on manipulating one-dimensional uh, sequences of objects. We only have a very limited set of numerical algorithms, such as reductions and scans. We don't want C++ programmers writing their own versions of common numerical algorithms. We want them to use standard interfaces that are backed by implementations designed and optimized for the platform that they're running on. And so the C++ committee is exploring new families of algorithms to standardize, starting with linear algebra. So we don't, we don't want to reinvent numerical linear algebra. We just want to standardize existing practice. And the existing practice for linear algebra is BLAS, the basic linear algebra subprograms. But using BLAS libraries today from C++ is pretty painful. They have low-level C interfaces, which often have a great number of parameters that describe things like extents, scaling factors, whether or not to transpose the inputs, et cetera. They've got like a dozen of knobs for each one of these uh, uh, algorithms. Depending on the platform, you may also have to deal with things like setting up library handles, transferring memory, et cetera. And so what we want is we want it to standardize a modern C++ interface that can be implemented under the hood by existing BLAS libraries instead of having to do all this nonsense. So here's that same code written using the new C++ standard library linear algebra uh, algorithms. <coughs> So the existing one-dimensional C++ algorithms parameterize data with iterators and sense C++ 20 ranges. For standard C++ linear algebra algorithms, we plan to parameterize data with MD spans instead. We use the MD span parameters to express things that appear as distinct parameters in traditional C-style BLAS interfaces. For example, instead of having scaling parameters on matrix vector product, we have a scaled operation takes a scaling factor and an MD span and returns a new MD span that will apply the scaling factor to the elements upon access. 
C++ standard library implementations can see through this abstraction and extract the scaling factor out to feed it down to those lower level BLAS interfaces that expect it. Another example is transposed, which returns a transposed version of the supplied MD span. As with today's C++ algorithms, we're planning to have serial fork and join um, parallel overloads of the linear algebra algorithms that take execution policies. But in this example where we solve a, uh, a system via upper triangular Cholesky factorization, we'd probably want to chain these two operations together and launch them asynchronously. And so in the future, we, we imagine that we'll have asynchronous sender adapter forms of these algorithms that will allow you to do that, just as we'll have asynchronous versions of the existing algorithms that we have. So there's, there's plenty of other work down the road for C++ standard parallelism. There's other classes of numerical algorithms that we should standardize. Um, there's asynchronous streams, memory model extensions, things like affinity and locality facilities. Um, facilities for distributed computing, et cetera. But we've already made a lot of progress, and with every standard revision, we are delivering more and more of the components of C++'s story for parallelism. So I want to end with where we started with our, our goal, which is that we need on-ramps to parallelism in standard C++. Almost all modern platforms are parallel, yet a shocking amount of code does not take advantage of that parallelism. And so we want to normalize parallelism and accelerated computing. Writing parallel code should be uh, easy and natural. Um, parallelism should be the default, not something that we think of as exotic um, that requires extra effort to reach for. All right, thank you all for your time, um, and I hope to see you all on next year's conference.